Good morning. morning. The scripture reading will be 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 25. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 25. Back whenever you possibly can as we meet tonight at 6 o'clock, Lord willing, and then each Wednesday evening at 7 for midweek Bible study. Broadway congregation is a loving and a very kind congregation of people. You're going to find that out as you visit with us. I'm very thankful for the beautiful singing that we've had today. Thank you, Jonathan, for leading us. The singing was beautiful. And for the wonderful participation that you gave and, and put into that and made it all the more meaningful and, and just a wonderful part of our worship together. And we're, at the present, focusing our hearts and our, our minds on the Word of God, the greatest book in all the world. And I have before you a graphic which I put together one which simply is saying the greatest events in history, the cross and the resurrection. And I'd like to talk about the cross today. Intentionally, I wanted to talk about both these great events in history, the cross and the resurrection. But I don't, I'll not simply be able to do it all in just one lesson. I'll probably end up doing this in another lesson at another time next Sunday, perhaps. <coughs> Please excuse me for this cough that I've still got. Um, I'd like to take a a moment and think about some of the scenes of Calvary and look at some of the important events that took place there and think about these matters as we focus on them today. Jesus came out of the Golden Gate. (coughs) You're going to have to forgive my cough today. The Golden Gate. It's on the east side of the old city wall. It's been blocked up and closed in by Muslims in later years. But he would go down into the Kidron Valley. There are three small valleys that come together. And they meet at the Pool of Siloam in the southern portion of the city. As he crosses over the Kidron and comes up on the other side, it's a pretty steep hike to go up there. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. As he goes along his way, he gives us, thank you for that. That's water, by the way, I want you to know. (laughs) As he goes along his way, he gives us a discussion of the fall of Jerusalem, which is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25. He goes into the garden, a little further into the garden, he prays by himself. And the prayer, which is so sincere and so from his heart, ending with the matter of not my will, but your will be done. It is said that the sweat was as great drops of blood which fell from his brow. His disciples are scattered. One of them betrayed him. One of them denied him. And he looks off and he sees a crowd that's going to come. They're coming with spears, and they're coming with swords and staves. They, in turn, would take Jesus. Judas steps up, betrays him with a kiss. There, in turn, as the events unfold and the mockery of a trial takes place, Peter then denies him three times. It's a tragic thing. It's a tragic scene, indeed. The crowd's calling out, crucify him, crucify him. They actually turn loose a guilty man. And they keep Jesus. It was on the Sunday before these events that took place that the whole city came out praising Jesus as their Messiah as he made that triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. As he did, though, as time would go along, now they scourge him, they beat him, they spit spit upon him, and they would eventually have him carry the burden of his own cross. The steps that one goes up to follow and trace the footsteps of Jesus is called today the Via Della Rosa, the sorrowful way. It is described in the New Testament that Jesus was executed by means of crucifixion outside the city walls. He had gone up the Via Della Rosa and gone out the city walls and there in turn be crucified on Calvary's Hill. Because the Roman in charge of this wanted to make the matter move faster. Jesus is spent physically. He can't go on. 
why they commandeer a stranger out of the crowd, and he carries the burden of his cross. He carries it all the way to the hill of the skull. He is now mercilessly mocked. He is hung between heaven and earth, and there in turn he's despised and rejected of men. And, of course, the anguish that goes with that, he bears the sin of us all as the sacrifice for sin. In the city of Jerusalem, there's a museum there. And as you go into the museum, there's a lot that can be seen with regard to the history of Israel. One thing that impressed me in going to that city and going to that museum, in a showcase there, there's a man's heel, the bone. And through that bone is a nail, a spike, which is the result or the artifact of a human crucifixion. We don't know who it was. We don't know exactly when it was. But we know that the person that is represented by that heel was crucified by the Romans in the first century, whomever it might have been. It was a way of crucifying people. They would drive spikes through their hands and spikes through their heels. Finally, the end comes, and Jesus says, it is finished, and Jesus dies. The earth quakes, the sun is covered, the great tapestry in the temple is rent from top to bottom. Great events take place with regard to the death of Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, was a preacher. And he said many things that you and I study very carefully. He gave us sermons, parables. He performed great miracles that we read about in the New Testament. We pour over every word. We look up and we try to understand in its context every phrase. Because everything Jesus said is precious to us. And Everything Jesus preached is something we want to remember. And God's Son was a preacher, the greatest of preachers. But what he did speaks more than all the words that he was able to give. What he did tells us more than all of the truths that were revealed. Now, this in no way minimizes the importance of the great truths that Jesus gave us. It does not minimize the importance of the teaching of inspired apostles of Christ as they explain the significance, as Paul wrote about it, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we've read about it this morning. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. And even though these are great words and inspired words and powerful words, it's what he did that strikes the chord in our heart and our mind. And of all the things that Jesus said, what does the cross say? And what does the resurrection say? And so I want to study that with you today. And as I have opportunity, I'll study it with you again next week. What is the cross saying to us and all that Jesus did? The cross says, I love you. Now, a lot of people will say, I love you. And it doesn't really mean that much. Love you guys. See you later. And we say it coming and we say it going. But what Jesus did gives love a great profoundness that we haven't seen before. No one ever loved us like Jesus loved us. No one ever did for us what Jesus did. And even though he was a great preacher, a preacher of righteousness, still this says more than all the rest, as great as those lessons were. For example... In 1 John chapter 4, beginning at about verse 8, you have this passage which bears on the subject. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. But this, by this, the love of God was manifest in us, that God has sent His Son, only begotten Son, into the world, 
so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now that's real love. Now people who don't love really don't know God. The atheist wants to talk about love, but he really doesn't love. He doesn't know God and he doesn't understand God. But the person who does know God and does understand God does understand that God loves us in such a wonderful way that we could never really comprehend the depth of it. God loves us. It's not that we were so lovable either, but yet He loved us and became the propitiation His Son did for our sins. Now there's a big word for us. Propitiation is a word which means to cover over. And when the Old Testament priests would offer sacrifice, they would take the blood of that animal and cover the altar. There they would cover the mercy seat with the blood. And in a sense, what was happening there was when God would look down from heaven and he would see the law in that covenant, that that, um, ark, instead of seeing the law, he saw the blood. If all he'd seen was the law, the people would be guilty and condemned, but he saw the blood in place of the law. In a sense, that's what's happening when those Old Testament sacrifices are taking place. But it does help me understand what Jesus did. When Jesus died for me, and Jesus died for you, and the sacrifice of that blood and the shedding of blood, that now God does not look upon me as being a wicked, sinful person. Now he sees the blood. That's what John meant when he used the word propitiation. I'm in 1 John chapter 4 and the verses, verses 8 through 10. And it says something about the great love of God and the great love of Jesus Christ. What I'm trying to understand today is what does that cross say? In a beautiful Old Testament passage in Isaiah chapter 49... There, Isaiah is talking about the sins of the people of Israel and Judah, and they were many. And I suppose that listening to the sermons of Isaiah, they became despondent in the things that were being said with regard to God and their relationship with Him and the lack of that relationship now. And Isaiah writes this about the love of God. It comes to us in Isaiah 49 and 14. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and the Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. He says, normally we think of a mother's love as the greatest of all possible loves. No one loves like a mother can love. Are there ever cases where a mother would not love her child or forsake her child? And the prophet said, yes, in some rare cases, even in that, some mothers will forsake their children. I don't see how they can do it, but they do. Some will. Some will forsake the child of their womb. But God will never forget you. God will never stop loving you. God will continue to love you and love you. And the cross is saying, I love you. Now that must mean that there's something here worth loving. That must mean that I'm the kind of person, even though as bad as I may be, Jesus sees worth in me and value in me and something worth loving. Sometimes people get down on themselves so much and they begin to say, well, I've been so bad. I've done so many wrong things. I've said so many wrong things. I have thought so many wrong things that they get so far down upon themselves, they think, well, there's just nothing worth loving here God is just not going to care for me 
And that's just not true. God loves us no matter how bad we get. He still loves us. Now let there be no mistake about it. God's going to condemn us in our sin. And will not be able just to ignore the sin or the consequences of those sin. But God loves us. And the cross is saying something very particular to us. Jesus loves you. You ever notice in the pages of the New Testament as you thumb through and look at the life of Jesus, how he loved the outcast, the downtrodden, those people who are on the low rung of the social ladder. Jesus loved them. He goes down from Jerusalem down to Jericho, city of palm trees. As he goes to Jericho, he's walking along the way and there's a man of short stature. Some scholars think that the wording there with regard to the man is not that it was so short in his stature, but that he was young in his age. I don't know whether that would be true or not or whether we could draw the conclusion or not, but he's of short stature to such an extent he climbs up into a sycamore tree because he wanted to see Jesus as he was passing by. Now this man was a publican. He was a chief of publicans. That means he's a supervisor of other publicans or tax collectors, which was not a good thing to be. A tax collector was a person who had purchased the right to collect the taxes for Rome and pay the Roman taxes and pocket the difference. And the people hated them because they were exorbitant in their taxes and their tax collection. And they looked upon them as sellouts and traitors to the children of Israel and the Jewish people of the day. You're too friendly with Rome you're collecting our money, you're giving it to Rome, and you're keeping it, the rest for yourself, and we don't like you, and they were on the lowest social level of the people of the day. And here this man by the name of Zacchaeus, he's the chief of tax collectors. Jesus looks up at him and knows him, says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm coming to your house today. Jesus loved him, even though he was so socially an outcast. I could tell you stories about lepers and leprous people that Jesus healed. And as lepers would come through the city, they would cry out, unclean, unclean, so that the other people would leave and get out of the way because they were not allowed to associate with people. They were not allowed to worship God in the temple. They were not allowed to have communal rights and privileges with everyone else. But Jesus saw leprous people and he healed them because Jesus loved them, even though no one else did. It's a loathsome disease. Leprosy is a disease of the skin, and it actually falls from the bone. But that didn't stop Jesus from loving them. Luke chapter 15, there's a story about a prodigal son there. It talks about a wasteful son. He must have been a very proud, arrogant type of individual. Give me my inheritance, divide it up between me and my brother, and I want to take it now, kind of an arrogant type of attitude. He nearly dies in the pig pen of starvation. But he comes to himself and he says, even the lowest servant in my father's house has plenty to eat and to spare. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go to my father's house and I'll tell him I'm not worthy to be called your son, but just take me in as a servant. Take me in as a slave. And the whole story turns around when the father sees the son coming at a distance and he says, my son that was lost has now been found. Kill the fatted calf. Bring a ring to put on his finger and a cloak on his back. That which was lost has now been found. has come back once again. You see, God loves him even though he's an outcast. God loves us even though we are sinners. There's something worth loving here. And Jesus on the cross, though he said many, many great things in sermons and parables and performed miracles... He says as he dies on that cross, one of the singular great events of world history, I love you. Even though you are guilty, and even though you've done wrong things, and even though you've said bad things, and even though you've treated people in the wrong way, and even though you were selfish and arrogant, I still love you and I died for you. 
One of the greatest events of all mankind, Jesus dying on that hill just outside the wall of the city of Jerusalem. And what does it say? It says, Jesus loves us. Turn with me to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 3. You get to about verse 3. It begins to talk about people and the way they are. And you see, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. That's the way we used to be. For we also once were, it says foolish there, foolish ourselves. The foolish person, he talks about different categories of people and types of people. He's saying, now there's some people, we were that way, we were foolish. We didn't know and we didn't even know that we didn't know. We were foolish. The foolish person here doesn't know. And he doesn't even know that he doesn't know. But he talks about disobedient. Now that's a willful character there. I'm in Titus chapter 3, and the verse is verse 3, and he said, We were once like that, Paul said. We were once foolish. We didn't know what we were doing. Once we were very disobedient, willful, determined to do it our way rather than God's way. We were deceived. That's a different kind of individual. The deceived person has been duped into thinking that this is true when it's not. He's been deceived. It might be that others have deceived him. It may be that he has deceived himself. It catches us all in that category, verse 3, which leads to what? Enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. And when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Oh, it's a different picture now. Christ came because He loved us. And because of Christ and His death and subsequent resurrection, we now, by our obedient faith, Not that we have earned our salvation, but that we have responded in faithful obedience to the washing of regeneration. We're baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Same washing Paul would talk about in the book of Ephesians. It's the kind of washing that he has reference to in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, the new birth. Now the picture is different. And it's all because Jesus loved us enough to die on that cross. What does the cross say? The cross says God wants to forgive you. All through the pages of the Bible, it's been leading us up to important matters and important points. It has an agenda. It has a course It has a plan whereby righteous God and sinful man can come back together once again. Notice Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, you see the point that's made clearly. When he's talking about Jesus, who gave himself for our sins. He's talking about the cross there in Galatians 1 and verse 4. He's talking about the fact of it. Jesus gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. The so that is a reference to the matter of the reason why Jesus gave himself for us so that we might be rescued from this evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. It was according to God's divine will. Why? Because God wanted to forgive us. And it wasn't just a matter whereby God would say, okay, I just forgive. Everybody, everybody gets a, a new pass here and everything's done and everything's over. It's not that way. 
He's willing to forgive us if we're willing to turn to Him out of obedient faith. Turn with me to 1 John. The book is 1 John, the chapter, chapter 2, and I want to read verse 1 and 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. There's that word again. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He's the covering for our sins. And potentially, the entire world, if and when, the world will turn to Him. God wants to forgive. And I think sometimes we may get mixed up in this idea and forget this fact God wants this relationship with us. He sent His Son into the world to die on the cross, and He wants that relationship whereby sinful man and righteous God can come back together once again. We have this fellowship. Fellowship's been run asunder because of sin. But now we can have this relationship. 1 Peter chapter 2. There's a good verse to remember in this particular reference, and I'm thinking about verse 24. As I turn to that particular passage, and it says, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. It's a great verse, 1 Peter 2, 24. Hebrews chapter 9 and 22 tells us very clearly that there can be no Forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And Jesus bore that on the cross, the suffering and the shame on the cross, because he is bringing about that forgiveness which God personally wants for us. What does the cross say? God wants to forgive you. We need to turn to him. We need to be obedient to him. Jesus is personally attached to this matter of, of forgiveness. The hands were nailed. The feet were nailed on the cross. I described very briefly some of the events that would take place on that eventful day. The pains in his hands, the pain in his feet, all for the result of forgiveness. Because of his great love for us, that we can turn to him by repenting of sin and confessing our faith in him and being baptized into him as the Bible prescribes divine mandates. I think one man that really impresses me in the pages of the gospel accounts here would have to be this man I read about in Luke chapter 18. It's about verse 9. And you see a wealthy man. He's a very religious man. He goes to the temple there that day. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. The book is the book of Luke, chapters, chapter 18, the verse, verse 9, that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes to all that I, of all that I get. And you would think if you stopped at verse 12, you've got a very righteous man there. But then when you read on, you read, but the tax collector, standing some distance away, was unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. He doesn't come near the temple. He stands a distance away. He doesn't feel worthy to come. The normal prayer posture of the day was to turn one's eyes up to heaven and to pray with one's palms out like that. That would be the prayer posture of that day. But he couldn't do it. He didn't even dare turn his eyes up to heaven because of his realization of what a sinful person that he was was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breasts, a sign of contrition, 
saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And that's what God is looking for. Men and women who will repent of their sins and change their life. Men and women who will do the will and the bidding of God and receive the blessings of God. When I think about that, I think about the Old Testament prophet Jonah and the remarkable thing that this man did. This man is told by God to go to Nineveh. But Nineveh had to be one of the most wicked, ruthless, and cruel cities of ancient times. The Ninevites and Assyrians would go into a city and they would just grab people at random and kill them in front of everybody, which was the sign, you mess with us, this was going to happen to you. They was as ruthless and cruel as Romans could ever be, if that were possible. But yet God tells this prophet, go preach to them. But yet Jonah knows these are bad people, and he wants me to go to the capital of these people and preach to them. So you know that story, how that Jonah decides to leave. And he goes in the opposite direction, the great storm, the great fish that God prepared, swallowed Jonah. And the second chapter of that book is the powerful prayer of Jonah. And God belches him from the fish upon dry land. And he goes and he preaches to Nineveh, and every one of them repent in sackcloth and ashes. From the king all the way down to the lowest servant. Wicked people. Why did God send Jonah to Nineveh? God wants to forgive. God loved them even though they were so wicked. And he's saying to them, repent. And they did. What we need are more Jonas today. who are willing to talk to people and tell people about their need to repent. More Jonas today who are willing to preach and teach the Word of God who will say, you need to repent of your sins and confess your faith in Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Acts 17, 30 and 31. You need forgiveness of sin. That's what you need because God wants that for you and you need that. Therefore, you need to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins as the New Testament teaches us, Acts 2, 38 and a whole host of passages. God wants it. And He wants this relationship with us. But it will only be had if we turn to Him out of obedient faith. But that cross says something else. God has a cross for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'd like for you to turn to that passage just for a brief moment. And I have a a few verses here that I'd like to read which surely will help us understand I have a duty before God. And as I am obedient to the will and the Word of God, I need to learn to fulfill this duty. I need to learn of it and fulfill it. The passage that I have in mind, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and about verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. You may have constrains us or something like that in your translation. It means this, controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. When he says there that the love of Christ controls us, he is saying that when you understand the facts about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ, and you understand the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it has a controlling fact upon our heart. It constrains us. It motivates us. It is provoking us to do what we need to do. You see, we have a cross to bear. Jesus died on his cross and said, in doing, I love you. God wants that, wanted that forgiveness for us, so he made that possible. But you and I have a responsibility to bear that cross. Continue with verse 15. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. The cross I have to bear is to live for Him. I am doing this day by day, living the Christian life, my purpose for living, 
We sing the song sometimes. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. And that cross of which the Bible is speaking for the present is my duty and my joy to live for Christ and to live for God day by day, which is the best of all possible lives that a man or a woman could live. Turn with me to the book of Galatians. Paul in the book of Galatians is doing a number of things. I think the book of Galatians is a very early book. It's one of those journey letters. I call them journey letters. He was writing this at the conclusion of the first missionary journey, probably from Antioch of Syria, north of Israel. It would be very early, 48, 49 A.D. Probably one of the first books that Paul wrote. And he's writing in the book of Galatians for a specific purpose, to refute the error that's beginning to creep up in the churches of Galatia. In the southern region of Galatia, some of them were beginning to hear ideas like, you've got to be circumcised in order to be saved. Or, you've got to go by the old law. Or, if you want to be a Christian as a Gentile, that's fine. But you become a Jew first, and then you become a Christian. And Paul writes this great book saying, no, it's not that way. Justification before God is a result of man's obedient faith through Jesus Christ. Galatians. But you come to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. And he makes a point here that really seals it. He said it before. He said it in different ways in this book. But before he ends it, he wants to say it again. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now, I think if we take a moment to look at what he's saying there and how he said it, it becomes more meaningful. In Roman culture and society, you didn't mention the word cross. It was impolite. It was not something that you would talk about in mixed company, and it's certainly not dinner table type of conversation. It's a word you wouldn't use in polite conversation, the cross, because it meant suffering and death, and it was a terrible symbol. But Paul says, I boast in the cross because it means I'm dead to this world, and now I'm alive to Christ. I got a cross I got to bear, and the cross that I got to bear is to live for Jesus Christ every single day. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, God wants to forgive me. But i got a responsibility here as well. I've got to do something. And what I've got to do is live for Him as God has prescribed in the pages of the Bible. I'm in chapter 5 now. I thought of verse 24, the book of Galatians. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We know what crucified means. It means put it to death. Put those elements to death. And don't let them be a part of your life. Because you got a duty to live for Jesus day by day and to follow Him as the Bible teaches. Now, Jesus is hanging on that cross. I wonder what was going through His heart and His mind. I'm giving everything I can give. I gave my life. I'm suffering and dying on this terrible cross. Does that mean I can now just ignore him? He's done everything that can be done. God has made it possible for my salvation in no other way to bring it about, and God did it in his wonderful divine plan. Does that mean now I can just kind of live any way that I want to? Don't have to worry about it now. I don't have to be concerned about these spiritual matters. I can live the way I want to live. I got a cross to bear. I got a responsibility. Does Jesus want this message told? Does Jesus want this message obeyed? When Jesus is dying on that cross, what is his attitude about that? He wants the world to know this. He wants the world to know I love you. 
one of the greatest single events in human history. He wants the world to know God wants forgiveness for us. And he wants all of us to understand, this is my work. To live for him. And to teach others to do the same. And let me tell you something. Because of that, it was worth every drop of his blood, every moment of his pain, every insult, and every hurt. It was worth it for our salvation. The greatest single event in history. Now, if there were just the cross, it wouldn't mean much. But there's the resurrection, which causes the cross to mean everything. Therefore, Paul says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1. And verse 18, don't go from this place today not being a child of God. Become a child of God through obedient faith. To repent of your sins and confess your faith and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. And to take upon yourself the responsibility to live for Jesus every single day and tell others to do the same. And I hope and pray you will. And I hope and pray you'll do it right now. Won't you come while together we stand and while we sing?